chefs, let alone three chefs. Okay. So all that means listen carefully. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Super, super nice. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Oh, so we can all hear me. Thanks, microphones that work. Um, my name is Abby. I'm the content director here at ICE. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here. Uh, in conversation with Sherry Bayer. Lovely to see you. It's been a minute. Uh, Lovely from to see you too. Thank you. <laughs> um, so about Sherry Bayer, uh, who, sorry, Fred, from working the floor at Charlie Trotter's eponymous restaurant in Chicago to founding the New York City culinary and hospitality focused PR agency, Bayer Public Relations in 2003, and establishing her weekly podcast, All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network in 2014. Sherry has always loved connecting with industry insiders and providing a platform for passionate professionals to share their insights and experience. Sherry is a former president of the New York Women's Culinary Alliance and has been a member of Les Dames d'Escoffier New York since 2010, serving as a committee co-chair. This spring, her first book, Chef Wise, Life Lessons from Leading Chefs Around the World, was published by Fight on Press. The book features 117 outstanding chefs worldwide, offering their inspiration, advice, and life lessons from both in and out of the kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sherry Bayer. So we're gonna play a little game to loosen up. Fun. I like games. I play a game on my podcast. It's a, it's a round of uh, rapid fire questions. Uh, that we we call uh, icebreakers, as it were. So, without further ado, actually, I'm just going to go off the cuff with this. You ready? I'm ready. Coffee or tea? Coffee. How do you take it? With skim milk or any milk? Hmm. Uh, super salad. Salad. What kind of dressing? Mm. I'll say, I guess a balsamic vinaigrette. What kind of green? What type of green? I guess I'll just go with, um, I can't think of greens. So I don't want to say mescaline, but I'm going to say mescaline. Oh, that's a good one, actually. Uh, dessert or cheese course? Dessert. What kind of dessert? Any. Chocolate. Any. <laughs> if you could eat anywhere in the world, your last meal, where would it be? Japan. Mm. I've not been there. Um, and if you could cook for anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, I don't know. Maybe um, my parents. Nice. And finally, type of cheese on a burger. Uh, pepper jack. It's a good one. <laughs> these, are, these are harder than I thought. <laughs> My speed round, I give people choices, like chocolate or vanilla. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I just did okay. You did great. Okay. Thank you so much for playing. <laughs> All right. So let's start from the beginning. Um, you went to college and yeah. then you went to culinary school. Yeah. And you have your master's degree uh, in food studies. Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> Uh, sort of. Well, so um, I went to University of Michigan. I have a BA in liberal arts, um, organizational studies was my degree. Uh, I moved to Chicago after not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but I loved restaurants and I ended up working in restaurants and getting inspired to go to cooking school. And I went to the Cooking Academy of Chicago, um, a six month program, which in the, it, the, the school, it, uh, has closed since I was there, but I found it, if I had to compare to schools, I would give it a little bit of a similar sort of setting or uh, as, as ICE here, like a small, well, it was smaller you guys have grown. So maybe at the beginning days of ICE when it was Peter Kump. Um, I moved to New York in 1998 and I began in the food studies program at NYU. Um, it was in its second year and I have 12 credits. And I took a leave of absence and we'll see if I, I thought I'd go back, but I haven't. So I can't say I have a degree, but I do have 12 credits. 
and it was a wonderful it was a wonderful um start into the New York City scene I mean Mitchell Davis from James Beard Foundation taught one of my classes and I got it kind of got me a foot in the door into what was happening here so um I love that I'm part of the program but yeah it's awesome Okay, so backing up to Chicago, because I just have to ask what it was like working at, who here knows Charlie Trotter? You do. Um, what was it like working in his restaurant? I mean, that's a pretty great one to have on your resume. Hard. Um, I always think, I, and I've had a lot of jobs and I, I'm a hard worker, but I always think that might've been the hardest job I've ever had. Um, I was a server there for a little over a year. This is 1997, 1998. Um, he was at about his 10 year mark. Well, we celebrated the 10 year when I was there doing tasting menu, doing vegetable tasting menu. I mean, so ahead of the time um, as a server with people's expectations of, of coming in. And there weren't as many choices back then in Chicago or anywhere doing that level of food. So expectations were so high and to be responsible for that was, was challenging. And Charlie was... He was intense. He was, I say a perfectionist, even though somebody who just did the documentary on him, who I know Rebecca Halpern says he didn't like the term perfectionist, but I don't like the term either, but I feel like you aim for perfection, but he, she said, or he aimed for excellence. And um, he had a table in the kitchen that was very special. And I would sometimes, some nights be in charge of that table and they had their own menu. They got like 20 little amused to start and they were all different than the other dishes going out to dining room and you're right there at the pass where Charlie can hear everything you're saying so it was nerve-wracking but I learned so much I thought that was like my culinary grad school I mean I was like salsa fee and the fish coming in from Japan and seeing them broken down and since I also wanted to cook at the time I volunteered before my shift which was a long enough shift but one day a week I went in and help prep in the kitchen because I just wanted to be there and see it all. So it was amazing. I learned so much from being there, but it was it was a very intense job. Sounds about right. And also <laughs> smart and good on you to to take that, you know, next level step of just coming in early and, and really, you know, taking the bull by the horns, as it were. Um, so you're in New York and you've you're connecting. How did you make the, the, or how did you jump into public relations? So my whole career has kind of happened by accident, I'd say. Like, I didn't plan anything. I didn't plan to book or to work at Trotters. I just found a love for restaurants and then got me, I did front of the house, I did back of the house. Um, I moved to New York in 98, I said, started an NYU's program, and I dabbled in lots of things. I food styling, recipe testing. I had an internship at Food Arts Magazine, which I loved. This is 1999. It was a small team. Um, it was an unpaid internship. It was it was fabulous. I, I learned so much from that job. Um, and then I got an opportunity to work at a PR company called KB Network News. Yep. This is in 2000. Uh, Kareen Bakum, it was her company. There weren't as many PR agencies at the time specializing in hospitality and culinary. And she was a hot agency. We were working with Todd English and Bobby Flay, and we opened Sushi Samba and Tao and Lotus. If anyone, you guys probably don't know Lotus, but it was a very cool bar lounge in the meatpacking district that had a very good run and we did their opening. Um, so I fell into it. I did not study PR. I learned PR really from this job. And I had that aha moment where I was like, oh, this love and interest I have for food and restaurants, this is what I can do. I can represent chefs and restaurants and help them. I don't necessarily have to be the one waiting tables or cooking. So that's kind of how I got into it. And I think a lot of people like going through the past, I'd say two decades and watching, as you said, you know, KB, they were one of the first to kind of focus on hospitality. Um, and now we're starting to see more boutique firms pop up, at least uh, definitely in the United States. Why is marketing and PR important for this industry, especially now in the age of social media constantly changing? Yeah, it's a good question. And actually, 
much. I'm headed. It is in the book. I did ask <laughs> chefs about that with your marketing. And I know Manit Chahan is in there saying it's essential. Um, so I'll take that as a publicist. But um, it's competitive out there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not brain surgery, I don't think, to do PR, but it is a full time job. It's having relationships, which is something I've never really, I don't know how you teach that. I think you got to get in it and just start doing it. So, um, but having those relationships and, and especially in New York, there's restaurants opening all the time and just to let people know that you're out there. And when I started, it was before social media. I mean, there wasn't, we were doing, I mean, there was email, which I'm glad if I started when there wasn't email, it was like, you had to pick up the phone and pitch. That would have been even harder. I think PR is hard. It's challenging, but email, at least you could send the message. People could read it when they have time to read it. Um, but letting people know that you're there. And I think PR is very important um, at the beginning of a, when a restaurant's opening, because especially me, the media just loves to write about new places. And six months in, even though you're new to your, you are new as a restaurant to the media, you're not as new. So I always suggest people to start PR before they open. Um, but it's, it's competitive out there. And I think you just want people to know that what you're doing and get it out there. And Publicists can can help spread the word and take something off of your plate too. If you're a chef, restaurateur, you could do your own PR, um, but it's just one other thing on your list of things to do that you can outsource it to someone who has those relationships and does it for a living and you know their expertise. Right, and it is a heavy, heavy lift. So to just and to hire people who know what they're doing is that's the way to go. Um, so chef wise. 117 chefs are featured in the book. What was that like wrangling, connecting? How did you manage that? What was the process like? So the process, so this was a dream project for me. Even little, you know, about my background, everything I've said, like I love restaurants, I love chefs. And I also a very big solo diner and traveler. And that's how I have a lot of relationships with chefs because I've gone around the world and I've dined, as Rick said, at a lot of amazing restaurants. Um, so in starting this book, the process was to first, I made a very long list of chefs, potential chefs that could be in the book. And the goal was to have over hundred chefs um, and not just uh, fine dining chefs or not just, and also we wanted to cover the whole world, not just the US. The book ended up, it's about a little over 30% US, the rest is worldwide. So I started with a long list and then from there put together questions of potential chapters, what the chapters would look like. And then I started outreach and I started with chefs that I knew uh, because also I was, I, I really, I signed this deal to do a book saying I'm going to have a hundred chefs around the world giving their advice. It wasn't like I was writing every page of the book. So I was like, I hope all 100, over 100 chefs are going to give me advice. And the outreach really, and the response was amazing, uh, especially for chefs being their turnaround time. I kind of was prepared to know, working with chefs in PR, that um, email isn't their, their best quality or um, getting back to people. And sometimes it's texting, but um, I reached out to chefs and and asked them if they'd want to participate. And the response really across the board was fabulous. And even chefs who couldn't do the book for some reason, whether it was um, time permitting or they had a conflict of interest or whatever, they were all really kind and supportive about it. And, and it gave me, it was like, every time I got a response, I just got, you know, the warm feeling of like, okay, this is a great project, even more so to be working on. So awesome. Did you, did you ever think in your, life that you would write a book? Not, it wasn't, I don't know. I was like, I don't know. I mean, maybe, but it wasn't like a goal to be, I want to write a book one day, but also I didn't set out to goal to have a podcast. And now I'm coming up in 10 years of having a podcast. So I'm one of these like doers. I, I work, I, I'm a worker and I, but um, no, I didn't have a goal. I don't think that I was going to do a book, but I'm very happy I've done a book. And once I had the opportunity to do it, I was all for it. So what was the aha moment when you decided this is what I want to bring to the world? So the backstory on the book is it actually wasn't my idea to do a chef wise 
or chef advice book. I was talking to, I did, well, I guess I have to back up. I guess I did start, I started to have ideas about doing a book of my own um, and on things, on topics like solo dining and travel and things that I do. And I've written some articles about solo dining and travel mostly, but I, um, I got into conversation with Fiden, my publisher, about book ideas. And it turned out that uh, Amelia Taragni, who's publisher at Fiden, based in London, she wanted to do, it was her idea to do a chef advice book. And uh, Emily Takudis, who I was talking to, who's a commissioning editor at Fiden, who does most of the food chef based books in, in New York um, and is a friend of mine. She made the connection between me and the idea of the book and Amelia. And that's how it the conversation began because Emily knew about my travels, about my connections to chefs, about my relationships, my passion for, the, for it. So as soon as I heard about this is an idea that Fida wanted to do, I was immediately on board because I was like, yes, I want to do this book. This is up my alley and would be a dream project to work on. And it has been. Awesome. Um, and the book is broken down uh, into these chapters of presumably where you'd find the advice you're looking for, whether it's teamwork or inspiration. Did you, how did you break down all of those uh, different bits of advice? Did you just go through everything and then you were like, this is where this category falls and create it that way? Um, no, the way I did it was, so after I had the chef list and then I, I put together potential chapters. I think in the beginning I had 12 chapters. Um, so it didn't change much as the responses came in, but I ended up adding or, well, there was a inspiration chapter and I ended up making another chapter on identity and pulling some of the stuff I thought would be in inspiration because inspiration became, I had a lot of content sure. for inspiration. Um, but I, I basically looked at, I came up with the, the, the ideas for the chapters um, business, team, philosophy, work-life balance, technology, um, what else is in there, sourcing. And then, then when I reached out to each chef, I didn't send them questions about every chapter. I specifically sent them a handful of questions on either one of the chapters or a few of the chapters, knowing a bit about their backgrounds and what um, topics they might guessing, like assuming what they might be more interested in talking about, but I really left it to the chefs to share as much as they wanted to. Um, they didn't have to answer my questions. There's chefs in the book. For instance, Paul, Paul Carmichael got back to me and he did not answer anything I sent him. And in, in the book is his 10 chef commandments and we just put it in there and that's his advice. And so um, some chefs, answered, let's say my five questions and that's came into the book and are in multiple chapters or some are in one chapter, some answered with a hundred words, some gave me a thousand words. Um, so, and I like the variety of it. I liked mixing it up and it's all in the chef's voices. It's not, um, we edited lightly, but we really kept it how they wrote it, how they, or in some of the, some of the interviews I also did, um, because with working with chefs, I was very flexible. So um, I did some WhatsApp interviews at 30 at night with the sure. Nand. Um, I did some Zooms. I did receive some voice memos. Like Wiley Dufresne recorded it on his phone and That's sent smart. that to me. So the advice came in different ways, but the chapters, um, they were defined first, but then as the responses came in at the end, it was like a puzzle and putting it all together. Um. I was honestly shocked to see that Jean George loves the instant pot. <laughs> um, were there any other thing, like responses that came back that just you were like, "Huh, I would not have thought that about you." It's interesting because I've been getting this question about like what shocked you from the book, and I can't. I still I don't have an amazing answer for that beyond that. Um, I mean, the funny one was Enrique Olvera, who who's more, has more advice than this in the book, but he does say at some point, don't take any advice. I was like, okay, that's an advice book, don't take any advice. Um, <laughs> I think for me, though, I found more, 
I love the consistency of chefs, like you're a chef from Hong Kong to a chef from Sydney, Australia, to a chef in Dubai, might all, all be talking about the same subject in their own words, but they're, they're basically like reconfirming that, that this is what, you know, with sourcing or with sustainability in the future, or like, you know, this is, this is the advice. So I think for me, that was more, um, it was like more of a comforting thing I was getting more than being shocked by answers. Got it. Um... ChefWise dives into mentorships in the leadership chapter. A young cook should look for someone who is willing to teach you, listen to you, and drive you to succeed. I believe this to be true both inside and outside of the kitchen. Who are your mentors and who gave you some great advice? <laughs> You're going to ask me whose quote that was. I know Claudia <laughs> Fleming's in the book talking and she talks. I don't know if that's her. But it, she does. Does. it is? I think so. Oh, yeah. wow. She talks about Tom Palicchi is also in the book and she talks about, she mentions him about being, you know, the opportunity to work with him. Um, I don't know for me with mentors. I feel like I don't have like one person that really molded me. I mean, going back to Charlie Trotter, I think he shaped my career so much, you know, just, um, but I feel all of the jobs I've had and I've had a lot of jobs. I mean, in my 20s, I had a lot of jobs. And finally, when I started my PR company in 2003 and I hit the three-year mark, I was like, okay, this is the right fit. I'm not moving around. But I, I mean, I think from Kareen at PR, um, you know, at her company, I mean, that shaped my PR career. And I think the chefs I've worked with over the years, I've just, I've been very lucky to, to like see the industry through their light and see how hard they work. And I know one underlying message I feel from the book is just how you don't get into being a chef to, you do it for the love and the passion, but don't do it for any other reason really, because it's hard. And I feel for me, like I just do all this because I love doing it and it's not, I'm just passionate about it, but I'm not, I work really hard, but it's just because I want, like, I just love the industry. Um, but I don't, I don't know if I can go back, going back to like an exact mentor, if I have an exact person. You know, um, talking about this industry, I know the one, we all, you have to love this industry if you want to be in it, whether you want to be a chef or, uh, you know, in publicity, food media, uh, social media, whatever it is, front of house. Um, and so we try to stress here how important networking is i mean you and i know each other from back in the food arts days and that's and it's been a at least a decade um and so and i'm like obviously you reach out to chefs that you know like at the top of your head to be a part of a book how has networking impacted your career tremendously and just and to go back to the mentor real quickly yeah Food arts, Michael Batterberry. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's mine. Yeah. No, as soon as you said that, I said talk about Michael. Michael was amazing. And I was, I felt as an intern there, I just remember going, we would have these meetings, you know, the editorial meetings, and it was a tight team, same Beverly and like same team for a long time. But I just remember being this meeting and Michael like turning to me and being, so what do you think? And like wanting to know my opinion. And I got to open his mail with him, like as a job. I was like, this is a gift. Like the man was just full of so much wisdom. So there, Michael Badbury. Um, networking. I'm a huge networker. I some potential, uh, um, what do I call myself? A professional schmoozer. Um, I, I, I mean, I work for myself and I do a lot by myself. I travel a lot by myself. I'm, you know, but I, and I usually go to events by myself and that is an opportunity to meet people that it wasn't, none of this was like planned, but when you go to an event um, and you're not with your buddy, you're talking to other people. So that's how I've met so many chefs, so many people in the industry, because I go to a lot of things. I mean, I've, through living in New York, there's just tons of events all the time. Um, I've been a part of organizations like, as you know, 
Le Dame Escoffier and Women's Culinary Alliance, um, James Beard Foundation. I, I mean, like I've, I've always just, my social and work life has combined into one. And I've always gone to lots of things. I've traveled. I've been, I just got back from going to the James Beard Awards and I did red carpet interviews for my podcast. It was the third time I was doing that. But I can't, I've been going to the James Beard Awards for as long as I can remember, you know, buying a ticket and going and just to be a part of it and traveling for festivals from the, the classic in Aspen to Portland's Feast to, I went to the Hawaii Wine and Food Festival. Nice. It's like my excuse to get out to Hawaii. So I've always done that. And I think that is why, one of the reasons I know so many chefs and so many people in the industry, because I've just put myself out there. And I think with PR, it's it's a part of the job. I mean, the, there's the part of the job with, you have to be, you know, on your computer and emailing or, or you know, writing press releases. But it's knowing people and having relationships. And so being a part of the community, I think, is a very important part of what I do on, on many aspects. So, Absolutely. And y'all heard it from an expert. Don't be afraid to talk to people. It's so simple. And you never know who you're going to run into or who you're going to meet throughout ta or through talking to just somebody, somebody you just met. That's great advice. Um, what's your favorite part of the book? <laughs> favorite part of the book. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, one thing I do love about the book is that you don't have to read it cover to cover. You can. And I wrote all the intros and it makes, I think it flows. It makes sense in the order it is, but you can just pick it up and read a page or two and feel like take it in, be inspired. Or you can go to the back of the book and see, um, you know, like Massimo Batoris in the book. You can go and just look up all Massimo's quotes and just read his advice. Um, you don't necessarily, you know, so I think there's different ways you can get advice or, or take the book in. Um, I'm just honored to have these chefs a part of my book. I mean, honestly, I'm sort of like, I know the book is done. I've done the book, uh, but I'm still like, how how is Massimo Batura in my book? Like how Mauro Colagreco, Dominique Crenn, Alice Waters, like they're, they're in this book and they, were, they gave their advice. And so I just feel very honored that they were, you know, a part of it. And uh, I also love the, I don't know, I'm friendly with um, Elia Park and JP Park. And JP just took home the best new chef for, for New York at the James Beard Awards. And he's in the book. And when I saw Elia a couple of months ago when the book first came out, like the chefs who all participated in the book didn't, I, 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 once I started getting some names in the book, I told people like, oh, this person's in the book because it, you know, always usually helps get other people on board. But for the most part, nobody knew who else was in the book. They were just participating. So Elio was just like, she got the book and she's like, I love it. And she's like, all of our friends are in the book. She's like, Rahelio Martinez, like, she, like friends in other countries, you know, from Central. And it was just the cutest thing for me that her to feel like this pride that chefs, their, their colleagues were also a part of this. So that made me feel really good. That's amazing. Um, love the parks. They're, they're such wonderful humans. Yes. Um, aside from the chef community and the hospitality industry, is there anybody else, any other audience that you, you think this book is for? I think, I think it's for, for beyond, I mean, it's definitely for, I think you guys, I would say, I think this book is for you. I think it's for um, aspiring chefs or anyone interested in the culinary field. But I think it's beyond that. I think it's a very businessy book or philosophy book, but things that can be applied to other industries and, and inspirational. Um, on my podcast, I do I, every show, I have a tip it off with a PR tip. I know now over 350 episodes. And so a lot of the tips, they've turned into life tips. And this book is called Life Lessons. Like it's, it's there's a chapter on cooking, but there's no recipes in the book. It's not like, a, it's not a typical, it's not a cookbook. It's a book more on the business side of things and how, what it takes to be a chef, which it takes a lot more than just cooking. So I think you can apply to, to just, people in anyone in life just to be an inspirational book. Um, 
certainly young chefs or, or you know, aspiring chefs or restaurateurs who want to know what it what it takes. Um, but I think we've also seen with um, the success of, the, of shows like Top Chef or Anthony Bourdain's popularity, you know, over the years that, I mean, his, his passing, how it affected so many people beyond beauty. I mean, just, there's just interest. And I think this book is for, show, like, can appeal to lots of people in different ways. And I think it's beyond people who are want to wanna be a chef. Going off on that, and uh, this will be my final question before we open it up to the floor. Um, Thank you. (laughs) Um, We always like to ask the experts what advice, whether it's life advice or career advice to our students. And this book is all about advice from those that we admire in the industry. Do you have any final nuggets of advice that you'd like to offer to our students? Advice is um, just to go for it. Like, do you? And because I don't know, I've always, I do me. Like, I, I don't know, think people think I'm brave or or my traveling around the world by myself or dining by myself, a white, white tablecloth restaurant. And I'm like, I'm not. I don't think I'm brave. I'm just go, I'm just doing what makes works for me. And so I think you just got to do what works for you. And I work really hard. I mean, I think people see my Instagram photos and all the, and I'm there, you know, I do dine out a lot. I'm very lucky that I've gotten to this place where I can travel and for restaurants. Um, And I post a lot of pictures of food and these amazing experiences and travel, but I don't typically post the pictures of me in my hotel room on my computer, you know, between those meals or at the coffee shop or working late hours and, you know, getting, get to get it done. I mean, this book, I, I I do a lot, you know, I, and I think if you, I would just say, if you are passionate about something, go for it and work hard. Like, you know, you can, you can do, you can, you can do anything. That's what I think. So that's my advice. That's great advice. Do you? Do you? (laughs) All right, Sherry, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Do I have questions? I'm going to walk around. Hi, thank you for coming today. That was great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak to a lot of prospective students here. I'm interested in what you think the language is crucial attending culinary schools to go into food media. A lot of students are very interested in the result, not necessarily understanding it. Great question. Yeah, in the book, actually, you know, the one topic that I think is not, um, has almost like a 50-50 sort of response is cook the cooking school question. And um, I don't think, and I think just from that, And I don't think it is a clear, yes, you should go to cooking school. No, you shouldn't go to cooking school. I think um, the chefs in the end, you you know, it's, I believe it's in the leadership chapter, like look into that and what the reasons behind it. And mostly it was personal reasons of, of a chef that went to cooking school and found, you know, that that got them to the next point or level of their career. And then the ones that just went straight into working at kitchens and didn't find it, you know, they needed it. And so um, I don't have, I I think it's personal. I mean, for me, the cooking school I went to when I lived in Chicago, I thought it was so valuable because I learned the basics. I learned like the mother sauces and just like what missing. And on my podcast, there's so many people. I mean, I've interviewed so many chefs went to the CIA or Cornell or, you know, they, they did get their start that way. Um, and there's certainly a lot of value in that. But and, and then on the flip side, people talk about the expense of going to cooking school and whether it's worth worth or if you can afford to do that. So I think it's personal. I don't have a clear like yes or no, but I don't in a sense, I don't think there's a wrong, I think it's, I guess, goes back to doing you what's right for you, so. Great question. Anybody else? No? Nope. 
Excuse me. But I have a with, with finances, with like my own, running my own thing. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think it was because I knew, I mean, I've always, I got my, I don't know, I got my first job when I was 16. As soon as I could drive, I grew up in Miami. And I came home and told my parents I got a job and they're like, you did what? Um, I, so I've always been a worker and I've always, I don't know, I've always just wanted to, to work. And no, I never had a plan, but I'm ambitious. So um, I guess I, I figure things out. I mean, it's, I've worked for myself now. I started my company in 2003, like I'm about to hit 20 years, which is crazy. Um, it goes, and with PR and with business, I have to say, it goes up and down. And it's always, I mean, it's, yeah, it's sort of, you got to you gotta go with the flow. I mean, it's very much, it's different than when you work for someone else and you have, you know, what your paycheck's going to look like and what, you know, your insurance and all that. But um, I guess I've just had the confidence to know that I'm going to work hard and I'll figure it out. So, and yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not not planning to be a publicist, but publicists publicist, like you can, you know, as far as salary, I mean, compared to being a freelance writer, which I've wrote written some articles, but freelance writing, that's that's a hustle really to to, you know, I mean, just I think uh, it's I think that would it's in a sense harder to make ends meet to do that because the pay is lower than and it's it's, you know, once you get more established as a writer um but i've always had so much respect for for writers because that is i think it would be harder for me to make a career and be like not be doing the pr and just be doing i'm just going to write um just by the nature of how much you know by salary or what what the world is paying for writers these days even though i feel they should be paid more um so it's not the same i mean sometimes you meet people who get into they're going to be a lawyer, a doctor, or something that you know, you know, you're going to be well off in that way. But getting into the restaurant industry, and it's, um, I mean, I think chefs will tell you this, and in, in the book, they tell you this like, it's not, you don't get into it for the fame and don't get into it for the money either. Like, get into it. It's the passion, but there's, you could, this book, I think, is inspiring for the success you've seen from these chefs. These so 17 chefs have figured it out one way or another, but they didn't get into it to be rich and famous. Um, you know, it's the, the thing with my career and having all these jobs was it all molded me into who I am today and the experiences and all like having that time even I spent at Trotter's cooking and I did I did Garmanger after that making seven dollars an hour at a jazz dinner place in Chicago and I got that experience and I didn't think it was like it was it was cool to do but I just didn't feel like it was going to be me and like I could be a chef or I could be a cook but I didn't feel like I was, you know, it was, it was going to be my biggest strength. Um, and I used to back more back in the days of Chicago, I, I used to just like read cookbooks. Like I would just scroll through them. That's how I got 
that's what inspired me to get the job at Trotter. So I saw he was hiring and I had his book and I had this one like book and this gorgeous photos. I was like, wow. Um, now I, I, as I live by myself, I travel a lot and I dine out a lot. So I don't cook that much. And it's, I don't find it as fun to cook for yourself as it is for other people. So I miss it a little bit, but um, yeah, I guess I enjoy more the people cooking for me than me cooking for them. <laughs> Any other? Oh, oh, this one off. You can. It got turned off. Yeah. Do you want to just be yeah. vocal? I looked through the book and uh, or I did know that uh, there were answers on a certain question or topic from chaps who may live, you know, three thousand miles from each other, very similar. Like I thought that was from the uh, affirming that that those attitudes and outlooks are, are valuable to be successful. But um, that said, you know, do you have any uh, comments or, or where you thought there's something different about America than the rest of the world or the rest of the world different than America that sort of came to you with the answers? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if I really found that from it. I mean, it was more the consistency of it than, as I said, than, than, than anything that was so like, well, this is how we do things in Australia or this is how we do things. I mean, I tried to have a diverse group of chefs in the book, so it wasn't all fine dining or Michelin starred or world's 50 best. And, and there's some couples in the book and there's some fast casual. Um, but I feel it was more overall, there was a sense of like um, a similarity, but I feel I have to give it more thought as to see. Yeah. And you know, there's. I also know, you know, there's some chefs who maybe answered three questions, and then there's other who answered fifteen questions. And if you read the ones who answered fifteen questions, you might feel like you know them. You know? And uh, I think here, all of you, some alumni or students, you could uh, sort of use it in that way. One I mean, one thing about all the people, they're, they're all successful. That means some of them, you know, they've won awards. Many of them have, you know, made a lot of money doing what they do. Uh, they're they're regarded, well regarded by their peers. And, you know, it all took a lot to get there. And, um, you know, those, the answers to those questions or what's in their head, those answers sort of shape them as role models. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Really. I really, and thank you all for being here. This is really an honor. Um, I think, I think the chefs were very generous and open and really shared from their heart what it takes to be a chef. And there's, there's stuff in this book about failures and that's like about, you know, it, it wasn't, I don't, I don't think for anyone it was this like, boom, I became a chef, I became famous and I'm so successful. I mean, going back to like Massimo Batura, like I know his story, I mean, or, or even um, uh, um, Rodolfo Guzman from who's in the book and he's, he's from Santiago, Chile, uh, you know, talk about like they almost didn't make it, you know, no one knew about them. They're, they're like ready to close. And then all of a sudden you get on like, like Rodolfo gets on Latin America's world's 50 best list and like overnight changes, but it took like X many years before that to get to that. So that's where the hard work and the passion come from. But I feel it wasn't, I don't think it's an overnight success for anyone. And Tom Colicchio is in the book and he talks about, you know, he sees it on top chef with people coming on and thinking it's just, you know, Maybe you're getting, you know, instant fame or it's going to be easy. You're going to get on. You're going to open a restaurant. And he's like, he's like, slow down 
and and you know just one step at a time like don't try to go so fast um so i think i think there's I think there's a lot of great advice in this book and it comes from people who have been in the trenches and it wasn't it wasn't an overnight success for anyone. Here you go, Chef. Made it. If it's a new chef or a new restaurant or bakery, whatever, what would you use the public advice? I mean, social media. I mean, so, what kind of advice do you have? We are trying to be yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think I know being in PR, like we're at, we're at the bottom of the list of like what you need to open a restaurant. Like you need food, you need staff, you need electricity. Like you don't need PR, but PR I think is it's it, it's very helpful. I would advise if you can, if you have a little budget, to do PR before you open with somebody who's experienced in the industry who has those connections who can just kind of get it out there about your new opening. Um, if you don't have that, you can do it yourself. I mean, it's not, as I said, it's not brain surgery, but you can put together a press release or a write-up of the concept and reach out to writers. I mean, you know, reach out to Florence Fabricant, reach out to Eater and wherever you're based, you know, you know, the local, I mean, the local, I've had some clients in other cities, like um, I was working with Eric Bruner Yang in DC for a while and, he was, I was working with him more in his national press, but he had those relationships with the local DC media more than I did because he was there. And so sometimes things went directly that he was just having that relationship with an editor who had written about something of, you know, his restaurant before. Um, but for new, I mean, social media is awesome. Like, I mean, it's, it's free for relatively, I mean, it's very time consuming. So, but you can, you can do a lot through social media on your own, you know, getting the word out. I mean, so much news these days gets spread through, I mean, mostly Instagram, I think is the one that the food media or restaurants are, are most into. And you can really get your message out there. You can take beautiful photos and, and just start building your community that way. So I would not, I mean, I think I was always, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, there's a lot happening there. But if you're going to start with one, go get on Instagram, open an account. At least other people can tag you. Um, and people like me, even though I'm not doing your PR, start doing your PR because I go out to eat all the time. And I then post about my meal and I say something, you know, nice about it that I have some experience. And um, people, your customers start doing the work for you because if you're doing something great, they want to tell other people about it. So get on social. All right. Wrapping up questions. Yeah, and I think go, we go, have go, a Rick. we have a raffle to get to. And it's on now. Well, um, if uh, you would be asked uh, what were some best favorite meals uh, um, that were, you know, gastronomy, um, what would you do? Why would you need to set up? And then remember, most of them I've been solo. And going back to Massimo Batora, when I went to Osteria Francescana, it was, he had had, I think, been the number was number one in the world and the world's 50 best when I dined there, but I made the reservation before. Um, so no, I don't, yeah, I don't take it. Reservation is completely on my own. I don't, I go through the system. I wait, you know, I set the alarm when the reservation is kind of available. Um, that was special because I met him there and then told him I was in the industry. He went around to all the tables and long story short, sent me home with Parmigiana Reggiana, aged 30 months old cheese that he made. So that was memorable. 
Um, Mido, Lima, Lima blew me away, the hospitality when I was there. I went to Central and Lima and Mido was really special. And they're both in the book, uh, Peruvian Japanese cuisine, just extraordinary menu. Um, a chef in Singapore, I, I went to a place called Odette, Julian Roer, he's one of the first chefs I reached out to because I had this, I was there New Year's Eve by myself, I think it was 2019. And I just had the most extraordinary experience extraordinary experience. Usually New Year's Eve, I stay in, I, you know, Saturday night, I stay in, I'm like the opposite of what normal people do. Um, but it was just so memorable and incredible. Um, Narasawa in, in Japan. Um, I've been there. He's in the book. That was extraordinary lunch I had through my travels. Like, it's just, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm really lucky. I took a trip to Bali to try to relax, which I don't really know how to relax. Um, but I do a lot of yoga. And Will Goldfarb now has a place there, room for dessert. He's from New York. He has this amazing restaurant that was so special. And then I interviewed him for my podcast. So it all kind of ties together. So it's hard for me to name one or, or pick a favorite, but I'm really lucky just talking about it. Like I've had so many amazing meals. It's like, it's, it's a gift in Copenhagen. I don't know the world. And there's so many places I want to go. And there's chefs in the book in Taiwan and Manila and all these places I haven't been to Dubai. And now I have new friends around the world and I'm like, okay, got to go get on a flight is <laughs> figure that out. So got time for one more. And then we got a raffle to get to. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's always figuring out, like, well, with each restaurant or each chef and like what's what's your story and why is it unique to yourself and telling that story and what's new always helps like if you have like a new menu or a new anything you're doing um the media loves new I mean I've worked with a lot of places that aren't brand new um new is in a sense easier because you know a new opening is exciting people are going to want to write about it but um I don't know I worked with it and has since closed and brothers of the past, which I'm sad about, but for many years, I worked with um, Capsudo Frere in Tribeca, and I worked with them when they were like 30, 31, 32-year-old restaurant, um, getting, and they were traditional. They were doing what they were always doing, you know, which was amazing, classic French cuisine. It was a family-run business, um, but bringing media in and, or influencers in, and letting them try the food and see what they're about, and their story being, so looking at their story as like a family run business and and why it's unique, um, the longevity of it, their amazing souffles or whatever they're doing that's unique. So I don't think, so older restaurants, whether a few years old, it's, um, yeah, people, the media does tend to focus on the new stuff. You just need to let them know, like keep reminding them of why, why you're special and having people come in to your place. I mean, a lot of it is just <laughs> seeing it for yourself, tasting it and believing it and, and being a part of events too. So I said, like doing events, oh, I did, well, I said me networking, going to events was a part of it, but I think chefs participating in events, charity events, um, things you're passionate about, getting out there and getting outside of your restaurant, where you will network yourself, meet other people in the industry, be a part of the community. I mean, I think that's a lot of the chefs in this book. That's why, and that's why what I was saying with like them knowing each other, being friends, they're like, they get out there, they do collaborative dinners, they participate in festivals or, or different conferences. And so I think that's one thing, like get out of your restaurant and see what's happening beyond, beyond your four walls. Sure. All right. Sherry, thank you so much. Thank you.